Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and good day to you all. I am Surgeon Captain Professor Akhya Rahman, and I, on behalf of the head of the department, Commodore Tariq Mahmood Malik, welcome you all to the 11th Clinical Pathological Conference and the second one of Shifa Hospital and Behria University. It is an educational series activity in collaboration with Pakistan Association of Dermatologists and being live streamed across the country and beyond. We are extremely sorry to keep you waiting, but um, due to unavoidable circumstances. Today, we are privileged that the principal of Behria University, Major General Professor Shehla M. Bikai, Hilale Intiaz Military is with us. I would like to request her to enlighten us with her views about this academic endeavor. Her presence here is indeed very motivating for us all. Madam, Mike not It gives me immense pleasure to be at the conference, uh, which is being relayed throughout the country. Uh, I feel that dermatology is a very important field in respect to when we have uh, skin lesions, and it's a clincher in diagnosis for certain syndromes and certain uh, problems which the patient may present. Uh, we, we work in great cohesion with our dermatological colleagues. As an OBGYN person, I know the importance because sometimes you are in a dilemma, people have been mistreating, but with collaboration, having a meeting together, we, we clench the diagnosis. Uh, I wish all of you the best of learning today. It's a very important series of uh, talks and uh, presentations that uh, Atiya has put together today. Uh, and I think we will all be enlightened with it and it will go a long way in adding uh, to our arsenal and diagnostic skills and treatment skills. So wish you all a very best of learning today. I'll be around for a while, and but uh, I will come back for the conclusion. Can we have the first presentation? G minus. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum to all. Uh, my name is Dr. Faria Khan, and I'm an MCPS resident in Department of Dermatology, PNS Shifa Hospital. My case is being supervised by Surgeon Captain Professor Afia Rahman. These are the outline of my presentation. So my patient is a 30-year-old female who was a, high, a housewife. She was admitted in our ward on 8th of November, 2022 through dermatology OPD. She came with the complaints of generalized red rash, oral ulcers, facial swelling for four days, and fever for three days. No, it's not moving. It's Skate quickly, the bar is slightly too slow. So her history of presenting complaints revealed that she was in her usual state of health four days ago when, when she developed itchy red rash that was sudden in onset, started from trunk and lower extremities, and then rapidly progressed to involve the entire body, entire body over 24 hours. Periorbital puffiness along with mild redness and swelling of face was evident. Dryness and scaling of lips along with painful oral ulcers since four days. Fever was sudden in onset, low grade, 
continuous and it was associated with malaise and relieved by taking paracetamol. There was no history of of cough, dyspnea, palpitations, headache, or any urinary or bowel symptoms. History of use of lamotrigine and, and birectum for epileptic seizures one month back, as the patient was the known case of epilepsy for the last one year. Her systemic history was unremarkable. Her Guinean ops history revealed that she had three children. The last born was 15 months old. Her past medical history revealed that she was a known case of epilepsy. However, she was non-compliant to the medication. Her surgical history revealed that she, was a, uh, she had append uh, appendicectomy seven years ago. And her drug history revealed that she had a history of irregular use of anti-epileptics. However, the names were not known to the patient. She was recently using new agent, lamotrigine and bivirectum for the last one month. Her allergy history, family history, and personal history was unremarkable. Her socioeconomic history revealed that she was living in a seven-person joint family system. Her husband was a sole breadwinner, and he was working in another city. Patient takes care of her in-laws and children. Her youngest family member is 15 months old. So physical examination, a young lady of average built in height, well-oriented in time, place, and person, well cooperative during entire history taking and examination. However, she appeared unwell. When she reported to us, she was febrile with 100 degree Fahrenheit and 102 beats per minute pulse. Her blood pressures were 102 by 69. She was mild paler in her general physical examination. Rest of the examination was unremarkable. Her uh, cutaneous examination revealed that uh, she had generalized erythematous macular papillar rash involving almost 70% of body surface area, predominantly involving the trunk and lower extremities with sparing of axilla, groin, palms, and soles. Facial edema was appreciated along with mild facial erythema and marked periorbital puffiness. Multiple two to five millimeter oral ulcers were present on the inner labial and buccal mucosa. The ulcers had regular margins and erythematous base, while the rest of the gingival mucosa, tongue, and palate were normal. Genital, conjunctival, and nasal mucosa were unremarkable. Hair, nails, and joint examination was also normal. Her systemic examination was also within normal, um, was unremarkable. So based on these findings, we uh, jot down our provisional, our differential diagnosis. Our first provisional diagnosis was drug-induced hypersensitivity syndrome, drug reaction with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms. Our second differential diagnosis was viral xanthum. We kept scarlet fever as our third differential diagnosis, and we also kept meningocoishemia as our fourth differential diagnosis. However, no CNS signs and symptoms were present. Investigations. Her investigations revealed that she had a hemoglobin of 10.2 and her eosinophils were raised to 9. Viral markers were unremarkable. Her serum, her serum ferritin was raised to 223 and her C-reactive protein was also 9.7. Coagulation profile was unremarkable. Her serum albumin uh, was 32 and her cardiac enzymes CK and CKMB were elevated. Her LDH was also deranged. Her serum amylase was 261 and her potassium was 2.94. So based on her elevated cardiac enzymes, we ruled out ECG, ECO and TROPI. Her ECO came to, uh, to have ejection fraction of 60% with, no, uh, with ECG showing no abnormality. Uh, based on her um, deranged uh, serum amylase level, we carried out ultrasound abdomen and pelvis, which came within normal limits. So based on these findings, we concluded our final diagnosis as drug reaction with eosinophilia and systemic symptoms. Patient was admitted at PNS Shifa Hospital and was managed jointly by dermatology and medical teams. Uh, foremostly, lamotrigine and bivirectum were withdrawn. 
Injection hydrocortisone, sodium sasnate, 300 mg per day was given. Tablet fexofenadine, 180 mg once a day was given. Tablet lecuzamide, 200 mg per day for epilepsy. Tablet MUK, orally once uh, daily for her potassium replacement. Topical trimelin oral gel and mechanozole oral gel for her oral ulcers. And tablet famotidine, 40 mg per day was given to her. 36 hours post admission, patient requested for discharge. She was counseled against this decision by healthcare providers. However, patient cited family problems and at home, compelling her to be discharged. She, uh, after discharge, she was then lost to follow up. We tried to contact her by going through her hospital admission papers. Finally, after a few weeks, we were able to reach her on phone. Her current complaints are polyarthralgias. Her father-in-law shared her latest investigation with us. Her latest investigation showing hemoglobin of 11.7 and her ESR is 50 mm. We have advised her to have regular follow-up and to have additional lab tests like ANA. So it's a drug-induced hypersensitivity syndrome uh, and it is a preferred term by some authors. It is characterized by cutaneous features, namely a rash, systemic upset incorporating hematological and solid organ disturbances. As per a recent study, the mean age of onset is 48 years with female predominance. There is no clear ethnic predisposition. Certain human leukocyte antigen types may confer added risk when particular medicines are administered. Viral reactivation has been implicated in pathogenesis. It's a drug-specific T-cell hyperreactivity. And viral reactivation, such as uh, herpes virus, human herpes virus 6, cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, and human herpes virus 7. The high neutrality of certain drugs in the causation of dress has led to an overrepresentation of patients with coexistent neurological or rheumatological disease, as well as in patients with HIV infection. These are some drugs causing dress allopurinol, anti epileptics that my patient was using, antibiotics sulfur drugs, antivirals, and miscellaneous drugs such as furosemide, omeprazole, and ibuprofen. Clinical features of DRESS, uh, it has a history of ingestion of culprit drug uh, in two to six weeks time, prodromal phase characterized by asthenia, malice, fatigue, and sometimes fever. The appearance of a rash accompanied by facial swelling is, is usually the first clinical feature to emerge and may provoke the patient to seek medical attention. It is followed by lymphadenopathy and internal organ dysfunction. Cutaneous rash. Uh, the most severe form is erythema multiform-like eruption. And if there will be erythema multiform-like eruption, we will keep in mind the diagnosis of Steven Johnson syndrome. Rest are articulate papular xanthum, mobiliform eruption, and erythroderma. So this is a very good table differentiating the clinical, uh, the clinical manifestations of SJS and DRESS. And it shows that in SGS, the onset is abrupt. However, in DRESS, it is delayed. Immunoglobin, uh, immunoglobin levels show no change in uh, Steven Johnson syndrome. However, it is decreased in DRESS. Histology shows severe epidermal injury in SGS. However, in DRESS, there is no epidermal change. Virus reactivation is usually present or if it uh, usually absent or if it will be present, it will be in EBV. However, in DRESS, it is present, as I have told you earlier. Human herpes virus 6, uh, EBV, and cytomegalovirus. Uh, sequelae shows ocular changes in SJS. However, in DRESS, there are autoimmune diseases. The lymphocyte transformation test is a reliable in vitro method to confirm the causative drug in drug eruptions. Uh, it is positive in acute phases of SJS. However, it is positive in, re in resolution phase of DRESS. Now, post-stress sequelae, uh, they can be, they can be, they can lead to autoimmune diseases such as thyroiditis, drug cross-reactivity, drugs that are closely related structurally to the culprit drug should be avoided in future. Mortality up to 10%, often related to unrecognized myocarditis and cytomegalovirus complications. This is a very good article published in 2019 by Japanese Society of Allergology. This article summarized the epidemiology, diagnosis, pathogenesis, and also described efforts to develop rational treatments for the disease. 
fetal complications and autoimmune sequelae have been under recognized establishment of a scoring system that can be used to monitor severity predict prognosis and stratify the risk of developing severe complications including fetal cytomegalovirus disease this is a table showing regis card breast scoring system which shows the clinical features or uh, such as extent of rash greater than 50% body surface area has one point rash suggestive of dress has one point systemic involvement lymphadenopathy eosinophilia atypical lymphocytosis organ uh, organ involvement maximum 6 points and relevant negative serological test one point if there will be less than two points then we will consider no dress case if there will be two to three points then it would be a possible dress case in case of 4 to 5 points there will be a probable dress case and in case of more than 5 points it's going to be a definite dress case and another scoring table sh uh, showed in the article that i have mentioned earlier uh, they show fixed and variable parameters and their scoring system varies from minus 1 to 3 they have further uh, divided the cases into mild moderate and severe mild cases usually have a score is equal to or less than 0 and there will be no need for systemic corticosteroids however thorough investigation of progression to autoimmune diseases will be needed in case of moderate uh, in case of moderate cases uh, there will be a score of 1 to 3 and there will be a need for systemic corticosteroids um, equal to or Uh, less than 50 mg per day will be evaluating the scores and there will be if, if there will be increase or no change in scores thorough investigation of cytomegalovirus reactivation and tapering of corticosteroids will be considered from 5 to 10 mg per 2 weeks uh in case of severe cases there will be a score of 4 or greater than 4 there will be a need for systemic corticosteroids greater than 50 mg per day will be assessing the scores then and if there will be decrease in scores we will we'll be we will be tapering the corticosteroids gradually from 5 to 10 mg per week in both moderate and severe cases we again then have to uh, have the thorough investigation of progression to autoimmune disease case summary so concluding my case a 30 year old housewife known case of epilepsy since one year but non compliant with the medication was started on some new epileptics namely lamotrigine and bavarectam for one month she developed a generalized erythematous rash associated with facial edema oral ulcers and fever relevant labs revealed a raised crp eosinophils serum ldh ferritin levels and cardiac enzymes the patient was diagnosed and managed on lines of dress to which she was responding satisfactorily but had to be discharged on request due to her family commitments and was advised to follow up after a week however she didn't comply and now complain of polyarthralgias and easy fatigability her esr is 50 mm fell at the end of first hour and warrants us further detail exam and investigation for her post dress sequelae these are my references thank you so much if we have a case discussion right away or later on just we will do it now okay and some of the funding will be available thank you dr farya for a nice presentation and i would like to highlight a few of the points dress is not an uncommon drug disorder it is one of the types of the severe <clears throat> cutaneous adverse reactions and it has mortality around 10% the mortality is mostly due to myocarditis or cmv activation another thing which we would like to highlight is that how her socio economic status impacted the level of care she requested for a discharge when we weren't thinking that she should be discharged she needed rest for herself and she said i have kids i have my own in laws and i need to take care of them so that is the reality of our country and we sympathize with it and then another important thing is that she had epilepsy for the last one year and she tried a new drug was tried on her that is rivaricitam 
we searched the medical literature and we haven't found any um, dress documented with Prevalhecitam so far. So that is worth reporting. And uh, then the another, another thing, as uh, Dr. Faria has nicely mentioned, that the sequelae of dress are under-recognized and patients are usually lost to follow up. And the important are the important are the autoimmune disorders and the reactivation of viruses, like the cytomegaloviruses and tuberculosis, tuberculosis in our setup. And another thing important in published in the International Allergology Journals is that um, the um, downward trend of using methylprednisolone, the pulse dose of methylprednisolone, it is better to use oral steroids rather than giving a pulse because that would giving the pulse would increase the chances of iris, IRIS, that is immune reactivation, inflammatory syndromes including the autoimmune disorders. They have followed up some cases of uh, pediatric dermatology of children who had dress and they were successfully treated with either with IV immunoglobulin or methylprednisolone, but years later they had autoimmune disorders. So, so I would now um, ask for any questions. If the audience have any questions, they are welcome. I would just emphasize her holistic care. Uh, because she is a known epileptic, a young woman, she would like to conceive again. So I think uh, involvement uh, for family planning and uh, pre pregnancy counseling and subsequent care in pregnancy should be emphasized because she would end up with more problems. She is already predisposed to autoimmune. She, was, she is very much predisposed to develop preeclampsia in a pregnancy, mm -hmm. which could uh, prove fatal, would have consequences as far as uh, perinatal morbidity, mortality, neonatal morbidity, mortality, as well as maternal morbidity, mortality. And a dose of folic acid should be added because of her condition. Uh, she's epileptic on AEDs, and which increases requirement of folic acid. And it is also helpful in you know, skin ailments. Uh, because this was the first time, it was very surprising. She never had a rash before. But these women, as you said, they would present in the fourth decade of their life. Yeah. So, so, but I think a holistic approach to management. She was managed very well. I would like to congratulate the team Thank who you. clinched the diagnosis and managed her. But and she's already having sequences, sequelae of the dress. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think she should be called back. Probably father-in-law is the influencing person we need to contact him yeah and uh, dr faria i would like to add that dr faria made a lot of hard work to get the paperwork to get her own documents get the contact number contacting them again and again and finally she was able to get through them. so that was the, the father-in-law's number and then he said that i'll pass on your message to my daughter-in-law and that's how we do Another thing I would like to know is, is it the first diagnosis that you suspect or this is the diagnosis of exclusion? Um, when because she, I saw it as, as the first diagnosis. Yeah, when she walked in and there was a maculopapular rash and fever, we immediately think of viral exanthem. But when we took a detailed history and she said that anti-epileptic agents, so many epileptic agents like uh, carbamazepine, lamotrigine, phenytoin, they're known to cause maculopapular rash. So they any questions from our audience who have joined us on Zoom? Or we can we can take the questions later on at the end. I would then request Dr. Anna to present her case. Okay. 
and both of the cases has been supervised by surgeon commander Najia Ahmed, professor of dermatology, PNS Shifa. A 30 years old male resident of Karachi with no known comorbids presented in OPD with multiple skin colored swellings around both eyes for two years, thickening of palms and soles for five years. Dental eruption was age appropriate at around six months of age. The deciduous teeth were normal, which were later replaced with small peg like. Body and face hair is sparse and light. Scalp hair density was normal, but most of the scalp hair turned fair and lightly pigmented with increasing age. Sweating was normal. No nail abnormalities were present. On systemic inquiry, it did not reveal any abnormality. On family history, his parents has consensuous marriage and there was no prior history of similar complaints in their families. Developmental history, there were no episodes of fever or other significant pathologies in childhood. Psychomotor development was delayed. Exact age of achieving individual milestone was not recalled properly by his parents. His IQ was less than individuals of same age since childhood, as told by his parents. He dropped out of the school in sixth standard because he could not cope up with the studies. He was born at term after uncomplicated pregnancy through normal vaginal delivery. He has normal birth weight and there were no postnatal complications. Past medical and surgical history was insignificant. On general physical examination, his vitals were normal. Other general physical examination findings were unremarkable. On cutaneous examination, there were multiple transcusant cystic nodules coalescing to form larger cysts bilaterally around the orbital region, including one nodule over right upper eyelid. Cysts were non-tender, firm in consistency with smooth surface and non-adherent to underlying structures. There were sparse hairs of eyebrows and mustache. Palms and soles had diffuse keratoderma. There was oozing of serous fluid on piercing a small cyst with a sharp needle. There was diffuse red glow in the lesion on trans elimination test of the cyst. Body hair was sparse, thin and lightly pigmented and skin of the body was dry to touch. His scalp hair was normal of normal density but most of the hair turned lightly pigmented with screen increasing age. There was hyperpigmentation around joints like elbows, knuckles, and knees, and there were multiple hyperpigmented patches over dorsal surface of the hands. On dental examination, there was poor, poor oral hygiene, smaller peg-like lateral incisors, impacted upper and lower third molar, molar, and there was generalized enamel hypoplasia. On ophthalmic examination, there were multiple cysts around periorbital region, including one cyst over right upper eyelid. Slit lab examination was normal. Central nervous system was normal. And on Wiesler Adult Intelligence Scale test, which was conducted by a psychologist, its score was 78, which demonstrates borderline IQ level of the patient. Gastrointestinal system was normal. CVS system was unremarkable. Respiratory system was also normal. On investigations, CVC was within normal range. Renal function test was normal. Liver function test were within normal limits. On histopathology report, epidermis showed hyperkeratosis, acanthosis, and increased basal layer pigmentation. Dermis showed benign cystic lesion, which was lined by cuboidal to columnar cells. These findings were consistent with apocrine hydrocystoma. Case summary, a 30 years old male presented with complaints of cystic swelling around periorbital region for two years, thickening of skin of palms and soles for five years. On examination, there were multiple skin colored swellings around eyes, which were translucent, fluctuant, 
palmo plantar keratoderma was also appreciated and there was also premature growing of hair and peg like lateral incisor teeth considering apocrine hydrocystoma palmo plantar keratoderma hypotrichosis and other features of ectodermal dysplasia like enamel hypoplasia we diagnosed this case as shop shells passager syndrome on management of this patient there was no any effective treatment for this syndrome although apocrine hydrocystomas were treated with electrocautery palmo plantar keratoderma was treated with emollients and keratolytics and psychological social support and genetic counseling was offered to the patient ectodermal dysplasia is a group of inherited disorders that show features of lived developmental abnormalities of two or more of the following structures like hair teeth nails sweat glands and other ectodermally derived structures this syndrome is an autosomal recessive condition which is characterized by palmo plantar keratoderma hypodontia hypotrichosis nail dystrophy and multiple periocular and eyelid apocrine hydrocystomas literature demonstrates that this syndrome has phenotypic spectrum of extremely variable ranging from full grown phenotypes to milder forms limited to palpebral and tooth involvement the most consistent feature of this syndrome is eyelid apocrine hydrocystoma which was seen in all cases these lesions appear in adulthood and are asymptomatic causing the delay in diagnosis there is no curative treatment of this syndrome therapies aimed at symptomatic management therapies include electrocautery of apocrine hydrocystoma surgical excision of tumors emollients and potassium permanganate soaks for palmo plantar hypokeratosis regular skin examination to detect any malignancy or benign skin growth regular dental checkups psychological support and genetic counseling now we present uh, the case report of similar symptoms which was also diagnosed as the case of shopshirts passage syndrome it is published in 2018 in indian dermatol online journal in this case there was a 36 year old male born out of non consensual marriage who presented with swellings on the lateral side of both eyes since 6 months there was generalized ichthyosis diffuse keratoderma and nail dystrophy and in on oral examination there was hypodontia and oligodontia this is the clinical picture of the patient thank you next case is present Now I'll be presenting another short case uh, who presented in our OPD with similar complaints. Seven-year-old boy with no known comorbid, resident of Karachi, presented with a history of sparse hair of scalp and hair of eyebrows and eyelashes since infancy, thickening of skin of palms and soles since the age of two. The scalp hair was thin, lightly pigmented, and brittle since infancy, which was subsequently dropped with its increasing age, and the regrowth was minimal with fine hair sheds. There were no apparent hair pigmentary abnormality. <laughs> He had focal keratoderma on bilateral pla palmo plantar surfaces since the age of two. The surface area of involvement progresses with time. There were no nail abnormalities. he had normal sweating 
cutaneous sensation was intact and there were no dental or skeletal defects. On systemic review, it did not reveal any abnormality. Developmental history, all my milestones were achieved timely. He had normal intelligence as per his parents, but there are some learning difficulties which were noticed. Currently, he studies in fourth standard. His, his parents has consensuous marriage. He is the only child. One of his maternal uncle had similar complaints that is loss of hair and palmoplantar keratoderma. On pedigree, one of his maternal uncle has similar complaints in adulthood and his mother has similar complaints but which were subtle. And the arrow shows our patient which, which is being presented. On past medical history, which is insignificant, on general physical examination, his vitals were normal. On further general physical examinations, there were no any abnormality found. On cutaneous examination, there was absence of hair on his scalp. Only few very thin, lightly pigmented hair shafts were noticed on the vertex of his scalp. There was diffuse palmoplantar keratoderma increased curvature of all nails. On dental examination, poor oral hygiene, there was generalized enamel hypoplasia and smaller peg-like lateral incisors. On CNS examination, there was no any abnormality. On vascular intelligence scale for children, which was conducted by a psychologist, the score was 92, which demonstrates average IQ level of our patient. On gastrointestinal system, it was unremarkable. Serious examination was also normal. Desperate examination was unremarkable. On investigation, CBC, all the values were within normal ranges. Renal function test was normal and liver function tests were unremarkable. Case summary, a seven-year-old male with no known comorbids came in OPD with complaints of sparse hairs of scalp eyebrows and eyelashes since infancy. Gradually with increasing age, he developed diffuse palmoplantar keratoderma. Sweating was normal. There were no dental or skeletal abnormalities. On examination, there was diffuse alopecia with prominent follicular openings on his scalp with few fine hair shed seen. Slightly increased curvature of all nails were also appreciated. This case was diagnosed as case of ectodermal dysplasia, that is Clauston syndrome. On management of this patient, emollients, keratolytics, were given to re relieve palmoplantar hyperkeratosis. Special hair products for dry hairs and wigs were advised. Psychological and genetic counseling was also offered. Clauston syndrome is a form of ectodermal dysplasia which is characterized by triad of generalized hypotrichosis, palmoplantar hyperkeratosis, and nail dystrophy. Nails gradually become dystrophic during childhood. Nail clubbing may also occur. Clinical features vary greatly among individuals, even within the same family. On management, there is no treatment for this disorder, and management is purely supportive. That includes special hair care products to help manage dry and sparse hair, artificial nails, emollients, and keratolytics to relieve palmoplantar hyperkeratosis. Now we present one of the case report where a patient was also diagnosed with Clauston syndromes with similar findings like our patient. It is published in International Journal of Research in Dermatology in the year 2020. In this case report, there is 23 years old male which, who presented with thickening of palmoplantar skin, dry skin. On examination, there was a spontaneous shedding of teeth, decreased sweating, and there was discolored dystrophic nails and hyperkeratosis of palms and soles. Thank you so much. Assalamualaikum everyone. Um, I am uh, Dr. Najia Ahmed. Uh, 
I hope you are enjoying the cases. Uh, thank you very much, Anam, for presenting such nice cases. Uh, we have shortened our presentations a bit to compensate for the initial delay. Um, we presented this uh, shop shelves passage syndrome because it's a very rare case. Uh, probably uh, you see one, maybe just one or not even one such case throughout your training. Uh, worldwide, only a few cases uh, of this syndrome have been reported. Uh, the important thing is that uh, the, there's no specific treatment for the genetic disorders. And uh, since now I'm involved in pediatric dermatology as well, so I wanted to present something related to that. Um, I want to emphasize that uh, we should uh, um, form some support groups like in the developed world because these uh, genetic disorders do not have any specific treatment, but the patients are quite distressed. Like in uh, this case, the patient uh, wanted some improvement in his facial outlook, but the treatment is again, the, even the symptomatic treatment is again tricky. Uh, as you uh, would have seen on this face, that even the quatrie and the carbon dioxide laser, which he got done from somewhere, they also left scars. So, um, uh, and uh, also in the skin of color, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation is another issue. So if at all we decide to treat such cases, we should keep in mind all these uh, things and uh, counsel the patient about that. And uh, we should uh, start the uh, depigmenting therapies before uh, doing any destructive therapies on such patients so that we can improve the outlook rather than deteriorating it. Uh, Clauston is another uh, syndrome of ectodermal dysplasia. It is uh, not very uncommon, but still, uh, since it was related, so we decided to present. Um, uh, so, um, if there are any questions, you are welcome to tell. We have another case as well. Um, so we can uh, take questions and comments even at the end. But uh, if anyone need to make, uh, like to make a short comment, so you're please welcome. Okay, now I would like to invite Dr. Faiza for the final case. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Dr. Faiza Zafar. I am resident of dermatology at Phoenix Shifa Hospital. This presentation was supervised by a surgeon commander, Naji Ahmed, and the topic of my presentation is a man with violaceous lesions. A 58-year-old retired deputy director of education, resident of Khuzdar, Balochistan, with no known comorbids, was married and reported to dermatology OPD on 10th August 2022 with the primary complaint being multiple blue violaceous raised lesions over the entire body for four months. Upon history of presenting complaints, the patient was in the usual state of health four months back when he developed small blue violaceous lesions, which were initially flat, then became raised and bigger. They started from both thighs, then gradually involved the extremities, limbs, neck, chest, back. They also involved the palate. These lesions were associated with fever documented to 102 degrees Fahrenheit, along with an involuntary weight loss of 16 kilograms in four months, which was 20% of the patient's body weight. There was also productive cuff with yellow sputum 
and no shortness of breath at the time of presentation. The fever was relieved with paracetamol. There were no other aggravating factors, no, asso no associations with pain, itching, ulceration, bleeding. Uh, no history of night sweats, trauma, infection, nor any history of transplantation, transfusion, or chemotherapy. There were also no lumps in the axilla or groin area, and hair and nail were normal. Upon systemic review, the patient reported a decreased appetite, and there was productive cuff present. Upon past medical history of the patient, he had admission in the hospital in 2019 due to pneumonia along with a history of multiple dental treatments in the last two years. Surgical history was not significant. The patient was taking paracetamol for fever. Travel history, allergic history, and family history were also not significant. In personal history, the patient was married with six children, age of youngest being 21 years old. He lived with his spouse and children, and he denied any history of extramarital affairs. Although the patient was asked multiple times in privacy and also counseled regarding STDs. Upon physical examination, there was a middle aged, emaciated patient of average height, cooperative, alert, and well oriented in time, place, and person with normal vitals on presentation, blood pressure being 110 by 80 millimeters of mercury, pulse of 76 beats per minute, breath rate of 16 breaths per minute, and afebrile temperature. There were no other clinical findings upon GP. Upon cutaneous examination, there were multiple discrete violaceous plaques and nodules that uh, few of them having surrounding erythema. They were normal in temperature and firm in consistency. They were non-tender and non-mobile, non around 50 in number with the largest measuring two by two centimeters. These involved the limbs, extremities, neck, chest, back, and palate. The oral mucosa showed white, creamy, curd-like, sharply defined patches that were present over the hard and soft palate, along with tongue. When these were removed, they left an underlying arrhythmatous base. There were also violaceous, well-defined patches that were noted on the palate. Systemic examination revealed coarse scraps auscultated in left lower lobe. So to summarize the case, a 58-year-old gentleman presented with four months history of generalized, scattered, violaceous flux and nodules on skin and palate, along with white curd-like patches on palate and tongue. These were associated with significant weight loss, fever, and productive cuff, and coarse grafts were sounded on left lower lobe. The differential diagnosis were made of primarily Kaposi sarcoma, vasillary angiomatosis, hypertrophic lichen planus. Investigations showed Unremarkable complete blood count. They were, these were within normal uh, limits. And renal function tests were also normal, along with liver function tests. However, other investigations revealed a reactive antibody to HIV, which was further confirmed by HIV-1 PCR. TPHA was also reactive, and uh, hepatitis B and C were non-reactive. Lymphocyte immunophenotypic report revealed a CD4 count that was uh, less than 200 cells per ml, which is classified as stage four or A's according to the WHO classification. So as you can see, there is a lymphocytic infiltrate and there are vascular sinuses with extra visited erythrocytes. There are also spindle cell fascicles present. This is the biopsy of a nodule with world spindle cell and extra visited RBCs. And this is the promontory sign that is present, which is a small vessel protruding into an abnormal vascular space. Immunohistochemistry was positive for CD34 stain, which is a nonspecific endothelial marker. And the final diagnosis made was of AIDS-associated Kaposi sarcoma. For management, the patient was referred to pulmonology regarding cough and repetitions, to oncology for chemotherapy, and to infectious, infectious disease regarding the management of AIDS with heart. The patient's respiratory workup concluded a diagnosis of lobar pneumonia. One week later, he was admitted, but his condition deteriorated, and he subsequent, subsequently succumbed to it and passed away. 
So we discuss our topic. Takoshi sarcoma is a multifocal endothelial proliferation of low-grade malignant potential, with a worldwide incidence being less than one per 100,000 in Europe and North America, to greater than 22 per 100,000 in Central Africa, where it is also endemic. The pathophysiology consists of human herpes virus 8 infection, which has the strongest association with HIV co-infection. Uh, human herpes virus is transmitted through saliva and blood, and the spindle cells are latently infected with this virus, which suppresses apoptosis and drives proliferation. So as discussed, the presentation is commonly in the extremities, most often on the feet, occasionally on the hands, ears, or nose. These lesions are dark blue or purple, and they are locally aggressive. Uh, locally aggressive lesions, however, can ulcerate, fungate, or leave pigmented scars. Lymph nodes, mucosa, and viscera may be involved as the disease progresses, and patients with Kaposhi's in the context of immunosuppression may have subtle lesions that resemble bruises or trauma. There are four distinct clinical pathological subtypes, being of classical uh, classic, endemic, iatrogenic, and AIDS-associated. The histopathology depends on the stage of tumor, being patch stage, plaque stage, or nodular tumor stage. Specific findings, however, are blood vessels which dissect through collagen bundles around agnexy and surrounding pre-existing vessels, which is known as the promontory sign. There are spindle cells, and there are extravasated erythrocytes and hemocytrin deposits. Other investigations are usually normal. Direct testing for human herpes virus 8 is not routinely done. However, testing for HIV status can be done. Immunohistochemical studies are positive for CD31, CD34, factor 8 related antigen, photoplanin, and there is granular nuclear expression of latent nuclear antigen 1. Complications include uh, Hodgkin and non Hodgkin lymphomas and uh, multicentric Castleman disease and primary fusion lymphoma. This is the AIDS clinical trial group staging system for Kapushi sarcoma. This table shows uh, the grades of zero and one according to tumor immune and systemic factors. T1S1 stage has an expectancy of 53% in three years, whereas it is 80% for others. Visceral involvement is particularly common in the AIDS associated Kapushis with the gastrointestinal and uh, tract and lymph nodes as the most important common sites. For treatment, they, there are local therapies, namely cryotherapy, radiotherapy, topical retinoids and antivirals, intralesional injections with interferon alpha or TNF alpha, surgery, laser, and photodynamic therapy. Systemic treatment consists of combined antiretroviral therapy, isotretinoin, pedophobor, intravenous chemotherapy, and others. So in the <coughs> summary of current recommendations, in early stage Kaposhi's, which is T0 stage, we are going to use combined <coughs> antiretroviral therapy and to consider local radiotherapy or liposomal anthracycline. In advanced stage Kaposhi's, which is T1 stage, the combined antiretroviral therapy can be added alongside liposomal anthracycline. And in anthracycline refractory Kaposhi's, Combined antiretroviral therapy can be added with paclitaxel. This is a case published in Curious in 2021 regarding a 23-year-old with Kaposhi sarcoma as the presentation of HIV. And this is a similar case in BMJ, uh, published in 2021 with a 30-year-old with HIV-associated Kaposhi sarcoma who had skeletal and widespread pulmonary involvement. This is a review regarding the medical management and prevention of syphilis in dental practice and awareness to the role of dentist in the transmission of syphilis via the blood and saliva from infected patients. And a similar case reported uh, that is published in 2016 in Brazilian Journal of Infectious Diseases regarding the role of dentist in STD prevention. These are my references. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Pfizer, for a very informative case, nicely presented. Uh, we chose this case 
uh, age related Kaposi sarcoma with the oropharyngeal candidiasis for multiple reasons. Uh, first of all, uh, we want to highlight that in our community, itrogenic spread of these infections is still there. It has uh, been eradicated in the developed world long ago by following strict sterilization and ethical practices. But in our community, especially in rural areas, these practices are still going on and the so-called healthcare workers or providers are still spreading these uh, serious illnesses. Like in our patient, he underwent uh, a series of dental treatments over the last two years. And uh, we asked the uh, marital and extramarital relation history in quite a lot of detail uh, in complete privacy. And most of the times in our society, patients initially deny the history of uh, extramarital relations. But at this critical stage, when they are diagnosed as HIV and AIDS, they do confess when they are told that your treatment would depend on it and things like that, they do confess. But our patient clearly told us that uh, he didn't have any such history. And uh, he also told that in his village, um, the, uh, many other people have also uh, gone through the same illness because of a dental clinic in that, that area. Probably it was the source, but um, this is a sad situation in our society. Uh, we searched the literature and uh, we only found uh, a, these very a few case reports about syphilis being transferred from the dental and uh, other search practices. So in uh, our patient, uh, HIV and syphilis both were transmitted. Uh, since syphilis is easily treated by a large number of antibiotics, so probably uh, without knowing he was cured, uh, as his VDRL repeated twice was negative, but TPHA was positive. Uh, so uh, another point we wanted to highlight is that if there is one disease which can be STD, the patient should be investigated for other STDs as well. Like in this case, because of the clinical diagnosis of Kaposi and the oropharyngeal candidiasis being present, we uh, investigated him for HIV, he was positive, and we also uh, ordered syphilis serology that was positive. However, hepatitis B, C was negative. So uh, these investigations should also be done. Uh, the next reason uh, was that uh, we dermatologists play a very important role in diagnosis of such cases. Uh, in many of the infectious diseases, and even as you all know that the skin is the mirror of our body. So uh, we have a very important role to play in diagnosis. Uh, like in our patient, uh, there was Kaposi and then there was oropharyngeal candidiasis. Uh, these are all a defining illnesses. So we should be vigilant and uh, we should uh, investigate the patient wisely. So uh, thank you very much. And I would like to invite uh, any questions and comments, please. Uh, you can unmute your <clears throat> mic and uh, make any comment that you want. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Dr. Shiraz Ahmed Dawach. I am General Secretary of Pakistan Institute of Dermatology. Uh, uh, I am really congratulated uh, to Dr. Najee Ashraf and her team for wonderful presentations. And uh, it's really fruitful for us. Uh, पेट की तरफ से मैं तो यही कहता हूं कि हम ये इस साल कंटीन्यूअसली हो रहा है ये शुरू हुई थी जेपीएमसी वालों ने की थी प्रेजेंटेशन उसके बाद दाव वालों ने अब जो है पीने शफा वालों ने किया ये कंटीन्यूअस ट्रीटमेंट क्योंकि हमारी पीएडी की तरफ से तो यही होता है कि लर्न एंड टीच मेन हमारा मोटिव ये होता है सो रियली रियली वंस अगेन आई एम कांग्रेचुलेट डॉक्टर नाजिया फॉर कीप इट अप एंड वेरी गुड प्रेजेंटेशन फ्रॉम द ऑल ऑफ द पार्टिसिपेंट and also really thankful uh, to brooks jinhone uh, ye on uh, live rakha zoom rakha so also really thankful to thank you so much dr shiraz is our general secretary of pads thank you very much sir for joining and appreciating thank you very much it means a lot i would like to invite dr sadia tabassum or dr sadia masood or any other senior consultants like Dr. Sadaf, Dr. Hamera, Dr. Rabia Gafur, anyone, if they want to make any comment, please. 
So thank you so much, Dr. Nadi. It was a very good learning activity, and uh, these cases must be kept in mind when we see our patients. So well done, and congratulations yeah. to thank the whole team, you. Dr. Atiya, Dr. Nadi, and all the residents. And uh, definitely, we have uh, we are grateful that uh, Professor Shaila Pakai also endorsed the activity. So congratulations to the whole team of Shikha. Dr. Rabia? Uh, I'm sorry if I'm missing any senior consultant because uh, I can uh, only see the names who have logged in. I am Dr. Me. Dr. Najia, can you hear me? GG, please. Uh, many congratulations. Sorry, Dr. Saib, I think there's some issue with your internet. We can no longer hear you. Yeah. Gigi, G, please. Yeah. Uh, 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 nice cases, very nicely presented. We must congratulate uh, to your department. Thank you. And uh, I would like to add, do we need to notify to the dentist from where the patient was receiving his treatment? We should, but uh, we could not. Because uh, that might be uh, the channel of spreading the disease to others as well. Yeah. Uh, it was in uh, a rural area of Blochistan, somewhere near Khuzdar. Uh, we could not ourselves trace it, but we asked the patient attendant to do it, and we also notified the infectious disease specialist for further workup. Okay, thank you. Is there any other comment? Assalamu alaikum. Uh, this is Dr. Reema Mirza from Civil Hospital, Karachi. Welcome, Dr. Uh, Reema. Yes, Dr. Najia, congratulations for the presentation of these uh, great cases. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I think this activity should continue and very fruitful for all the uh, postgraduate students. Congratulations. Thank you, Dr. Sadia Masood, uh, Head of Department of Dermatology, Aga Khan University, is with us. Uh, Dr. Sadia, would you like to say something? So, uh, yeah, so if there are no further questions, I would like to thank you all for joining us. And uh, I would especially uh, like to appreciate my team members, uh, Surgeon Captain Atia, uh, Dr. Padia, Dr. Anam, and Dr. Faiza. They worked really hard. All of us spent a lot of time preparing these cases for you all. Uh, now, I would also like to invite uh, Madam. Uh, Major General Shehla Bakay, uh, to please make a few comments. Thank you. Uh, I would like to congratulate uh, Nadia and uh, and team dermatology of Jaina uh, Shippa and Burial University uh, Medical College. It was indeed a great pleasure to be here. Initially, I had decided that I will be here for the uh, opening and the concluding remarks. But the cakes uh, mix, mix was so interesting that I stayed back. Thank you. Thank <laughs> okay. you very much. So the, the cases were very interesting, very well selected with good learning value. And they were very well researched and excellently presented by our young presenters. So it was great uh, to be here for this academic session. And I would like to request you to continue it. I think you're doing a great service with the Zoom learning. I think in COVID area, 
we learn how to communicate uh, nationally and internationally virtually with great ease. So I think you have made good use of the technology and wonderful to be here. And congratulations once again. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you. So this is very motivating for us. Thank you. 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 Th